This game sucks and I hate it. Still, yes, this is real, I'm actually reviewing the DLC for Dead Rising 3. I didn't half-ass it either, I even went back and played through the entirety of the base game beforehand, which I streamed and you can watch for yourself. Playing it again after two blissful years of not even thinking about the game was quite the experience. I was already planning on opening this video by doubling down on a few points from the critique, trying my best to better explain the foundational problems that infect every inch of the game. However, I went into my repeat playthrough with an open mind. I thought, hey now, I'm a different person, I've matured and gained perspective in this span of time, maybe the clouds will part and the glory of Dead Rising 3 will shine down, enlightening me in front of a live audience of about 15 people on average. Instead, I came away with an even worse view on the game. The parts that I had praised to the moon and back in my two-hour video, I thought this time were okay. Gary is fine, his voice actor is good, but nothing about his interactions with Nick were anything that remarkable. My guess is the utter trash that is Dead Rising 3 it made me cling to any and every morsel of mediocrity available, one of which turned out to be Gary. I specifically remember, in that 11-hour stream, thinking to myself as the cutscene I had praised so strongly played in front of my eyes, this is fine, I guess. The exact same sentiment followed with the other cutscene I talked positively of, it was fine. Besides one exception I'll talk about later, fine is the peak, the all-time highs of Dead Rising 3. Even Dylan, who I gave credit to for being funny in retrospect, since he caused me to burst out laughing while recording the voice lines for the video, is just kinda dumb. I'll admit that a few things I said in my critique come across as nitpicky, such as the narrow pathway is not always fitting your character. However, after playing the game again and giving the two-hour video a watch-through, honestly, most of what I said holds up. Many were even worse than I remember, such as the random white flickering in the intro, the lack of organization for the blueprints in the menu, the game defaulting your weapon to the top-slotted item in the wheel whenever you throw or eat something, and the utterly god-awful tragic endings, the puns of which sometimes being so terrible, I genuinely couldn't believe it. The headliner really killed it. That was awful. That was fucking terrible. They suck at this. They suck at it. Anyway. Now undeterred, in my original pursuit, I shall re-review the game with fresh eyes, mostly by trying to articulate clearer the main issues with the game, of which there are three. Yes, the pretentious and edgy vibe the game shoots for is lame. Yes, it's not as interesting of a Dead Rising game if the survivors are invulnerable and can't be escorted. Except a select few, I guess. Everyone else! Get, everyone get out! Everyone get the fuck out! Get, Kelsey, run! Kelsey, run! Kelsey, run! Kelsey, run! Kelsey, run! No, not towards it! Fucking Kelsey, I swear. And yes, the jokes, characters, and story just aren't very good. All of those are problems, absolutely, but even if you somehow fixed each and every one of them, the game would still suck to play due to the three central issues of Dead Rising 3. The movement system, the open world, and the items. Recently I've been playing The Last of Us Part 2, and putting aside how anyone feels about the story and characters, the gameplay is rock solid. Cranking the difficulty sliders up turns almost every combat encounter into a high-stakes struggle for survival, a visceral and intense experience that I've really come to love. The reason I'm talking about The Last of Us in a Dead Rising 3 video comes down to the way the characters in each game move around. The only argument I could possibly fathom someone using to defend Nick crawling out of his halted momentum stance is that it's more realistic. For all the flack Naughty Dog gets, some of it deserved and most of it not, one thing I think everyone can agree on is how incredible their animations are. As far as I'm concerned, they set the bar. Be it kill sequences, facial expressions, or simply walking and running around, there's not many games out there that look this good and have such smooth and realistic animations. I could compare Dead Rising 3 to the first Last of Us, which might seem more fair given that it too came out in 2013, and yeah, the comparison would mostly be the same, as Joel can easily go from aiming his gun to running with barely any delay, and the animations there are still, on the whole, very good. However, the reason I'm more interested in talking about Part 2 is that this is what the peak looks like. Naughty Dog, for better and worse, are clearly obsessed with making graphically impressive, environmentally detailed, and true-to-life looking games. Even still, with so much focus being on the story, the characters, the walking simulator adjacent downtimes between fights, Ellie can move out of a dead stop position into a walk, jog, or sprint without any slowdown or hassle, she can quickly go from crouched into a sprint, and she doesn't turn into a sloth randomly when she puts down her gun. 
the game you'd think would gimp its gameplay in service to its goals of looking and feeling as realistic as possible, allows for buttery smooth movement, letting the player run free and take advantage of any speed that might help them survive a deadly encounter. Both are zombie games, one of the two trying its hardest to be mature and immersive, and yet the arcadey slapstick humor zombie title is the one where every single time you drop a weapon, you have to suffer the wrath of Nick limping until he gets to his base speed. Every time you stop firing a gun, even though you can move while shooting, Nick stops to take in the scenery before thinking about picking up the pace. Insane how far we've come from Dead Rising 1. There you stopped moving when shooting, but could start running right away after. It worked perfectly fine since firing a gun wasn't even close to the main focus of the game. Dead Rising 2 let Chuck move while shooting, which I don't love, but he at least kept his momentum after you put the gun down. In Dead Rising 3, you still can move while you shoot, but you walk at a snail's pace after you stop firing. Every single combat encounter in the game is made worse thanks to this movement system. I do still think the roll maneuver is far better in Dead Rising 3 than it was in 1 and 2, but even though you get a big boost out of your standing position, he still stumbles out of the roll itself, meaning you're essentially forced to continue rolling over and over to get out of a bad spot, or bite the bullet and embrace that damned startup time when getting to the speed you're aiming for. Sprinting out of a roll or a standstill feels like it should be the solution, but it only affects your speed after Nick takes his first few steps. There are times where it looks like he starts out a little quicker, but it doesn't feel consistent, and is still slower than it should be. The only thing that seems to kind of get you up to speed after losing it is jumping the moment you gain control again, and since I'm used to Dead Rising 1's movement system, I tend to jump as I'm running around near zombie hordes without thinking anyway. However, jumping clearly isn't the silver bullet either, since I instinctively spam it when near zombies, but I run into the dead stop issue or heavy slowdown from enemies all the same. I'm sure I'll be using some DLC footage a bit early, so forgive me, but it's the same movement system, so really it's the same thing. Here, I can see that the barrel to my right is going to explode, so I try to run out of its radius. But, because I just put my gun down, I lose what speed I had, and I take a hit. Even just maintaining his current velocity with his gun drawn, I likely could have escaped it unharmed. What would be a very simple thing to do is made impossible without a roll dodge. Adding on to all of this, you don't get a fucking on-screen stamina meter for your sprint, you just slow down and can't use it for a while. Even though they jammed every other non-diegetic doohickey on screen, stamina bars are where they draw the line. You get the minimap, destination markers, health, level, locations, notification PP pop-ups, and for some ungodly reason, the tutorial messages which clogs 10% of the screen with black bars, but no. No room for informing the player of how much stamina they have. It's all just so goddamn terrible. When I think of playing Dead Rising 3, legitimately, the movement is the first thing that springs to mind. The act of moving my character is such a clunky experience that no matter what stage of the game I'm in, or what's going on around me, this issue is always something on my mind, whether responding to it or planning for it. I don't know how so many can overlook such a basic problem, I genuinely cannot get used to it, and it's all the worse since running and jumping to get through zombie hordes is basically a crapshoot. Maybe you could argue I shouldn't be wandering through Lost Perdidos on foot, as the size of this open world obviously suggests a player should be driving. Well, that's where you're wrong, as roadblocks, as realistic as they supposedly may be to this fictionalized zombie apocalyptic setting, all but guarantee that players will be forced to constantly abandon their cars, or at the very least, pull the map screen up over and over and over and over and over to find the route that isn't blocked. I think most people would likely agree that this open world is too big, even if they like the game, but seriously, too big isn't even the half of it. I cannot believe the designers at Capcom Vancouver created this map, designed this god-awful highway system, and thought, yeah, this will be fun for the player to drive through repeatedly. Interacting with the on and off ramps dozens of times a playthrough, which only leads to a concrete slab of rundown cars and the odd ZDC speaker or firework truck, is such a slog it's unbearable. An argument could be raised that it was a necessary evil, the highway system exists for them to load in each new part of town seamlessly. I desperately want to believe that, that even Capcom Vancouver weren't happy with its implementation and regretted having the player deal with it so often, but Overtime Mode in its entirety makes that impossible to accept. Huge spoilers for Overtime Mode, which is the end of the game. Skip to here to avoid spoilers. 3, 2, 1. 
If Capcom Vancouver had any awareness of their driving and highway system being cumbersome, they definitely wouldn't have had Hemlock's plane constantly fly from one section of the map all the way to the other side. Overtime mode is dreadful, and the Chuck barely does anything except slow you down if you decide to wait for him to get into your car. I actually found the end boss to be fine this time around, even though I failed a few times. Just space properly and spam the baseball bat strong attack. Everything before it, though, is truly some of the worst times I've had with this entire series. Thanks to the suddenly dexterous and somehow now situationally intelligent zombies grabbing onto your car and holding on for dear life, your vehicle is likely to blow up after a few minutes of driving through this mass of flesh. If you manage to get lucky, though, or have the magazine and skill upgrades to keep your car in one piece for longer, you'll still get utterly bamboozled by the level design. Funny enough, here is where the arrow marker that was in the previous games would come in handy the most, as it could at least attempt to point you in the right direction to avoid roadblocks. Nah, Crazy Taxi might sue them since they're in a car, I don't know, so instead, the destination markers serve no value in your attempts to use the most efficient route. You'll open up your map a hundred times regardless if you hop to a new car or not. Even imagining a version of this game that somehow didn't need the highway at all, where these four sectors of the map could coexist without the supposed necessary evil, the map itself would still be pretty dog shit. It likes to jump you to the main story destination marker, which is irritating, but for me, what was so baffling in my third playthrough was the lack of information on the buildings. In the first two games, you could open your map and see the names of the stores when hovering over them. Since it was a mall, or a casino strip, and the outbreak just happened, everything was likely where you expected it, which would make the hunt for specific items for combo weapons a bit easier. No such benefit was afforded in Dead Rising 3. Everything is grey, with no indication on what the building might house, unless, of course, when talking of the collectibles and quest goals, which the game is all too eager to clog your screen with. I realize 72 hours after the outbreak might mean a few of the stores could be looted already, and some weapons and other items moved around, but surely the nearest hardware store would be the best place to look for a chainsaw? Something required for a side quest? Why, yes, it is the only place with a chainsaw, but why on earth couldn't I use the map to find where the nearest hardware store was? It's actually kind of ironic, I was so conditioned to meet the game on its terms that initially, I just ran around and hoped I would stumble onto one while aimlessly wandering. That is the solution, after all, to finding rocket launchers, grenades, shotguns, Assault rifles, large machine guns, grenade launchers, broadswords, katanas, and many other seemingly high-powered weapons. It's almost as if, internally, Capcom Vancouver was at odds with itself. Maybe the people in charge of Nick's movement wanted to discourage the reliance on guns to feel closer to the previous games in the series, and made using them a clunky chore, always limiting your momentum with every empty clip and pause to aim. You do keep your momentum as you swing a melee weapon, after all. Meanwhile, the people whose job it was to place items around the city wanted the player to find guns without hassle. So many of the combo weapons involve certain items, and to really let the player get the most out of that system, they kinda need to litter a bunch of that garbage all over. The city is so big, the map so unhelpful, and the multi-purpose stores so infrequent, not dousing the landscape with umbrellas, dragon helmets, giant teddy bears, and large machine guns means a player would have to deal with the non-combo weapons more often. You know, random objects such as cash registers, benches, garbage cans, sporting equipment, and other non-lethal varieties. Who would want that, right? It's so interesting how much these three core problems of Dead Rising 3 bring out the worst in each other. I doubt there would be so many random powerful weapons scattered every which way if the overworld wasn't so utterly tiring to navigate, the locations in it given unique items, and the map itself being easier to utilize when on the hunt for those items. Maybe the quality of life feature of being able to craft anything anywhere, instead of only at the workbenches, also had a hand in this. Placing a few important pieces for a couple combo weapons, of which there are fewer overall, near maintenance rooms was a very easy solution that didn't feel all that contrived, it was convenient and fit in just fine. Without those designated areas where players will combine items together, guess we gotta throw in a ton of ridiculous weapons haphazardly all over the place. The quantity of those ridiculous weapons, such as every shooty-shooty gun under the sun, means you're more likely to use them in a pinch, shining a spotlight on the momentum system problem with every boss fight and close call zombie encounter. The momentum system problem existing in and of itself encourages the use of driving, but the roadblocks, low vehicle armor, and randomly smart zombies that hold on for dear life disincentivize driving, meaning you're stuck toughing out the zombie hordes on foot or painstakingly hopping from vehicle to vehicle once you reach one of the many roadblocks, 
which limits your movement speed overall, which is likely why there are so many ridiculous weapons scattered all over, and so on and repeat. It's a cycle, all of it feeds into each other to craft an unforgettably awful experience. The combo weapons themselves being mostly boring make all of this so much worse, since it feels like all of these concessions were made for no real payoff. I'm so not interested in 8 iterations of the Freedom Bear, and yes, I did go out of my way to try quite a few of them this time, and they fucking suck. The fact that you can just go to a locker and obtain a bunch of OP weapons is also ridiculous. This tips the scales in favor of the player to an unnecessary degree, while also disincentivizing the use of anything but the best of the best. Maybe this is why the zombies this time around feel more like traditional enemies, with their higher tendencies to grab, surround, and lunge at a player. In the original Dead Rising, and to an extent the second game, the zombies nearly resembled a force of nature. They of course could attack you, but they were a bumbling mass of flesh for the most part. They sometimes blended in so well with the setting that you avoided them as you would hazardous terrain in other games. Now they never leave you the fuck alone, and are much faster. The cherry on top is that when you do try to engage with the game and have fun with its systems, it still fights with you. I know I said it in the critique, and earlier as well, but seriously, how the fuck do they not think to let you sort this combo weapon list? Give me alphabetical, give me weapon type, give me all combos that require a leaf blower. So many combo weapons are iterative of something else, which is lame full stop, but how the team didn't think to, at the very least, group those samey weapons together? It's absolute insanity. It's just trash, all of it. What a garbage fucking game. And just so everyone is clear here, yes, Dead Rising 4 is a bad game. That has no bearing on Dead Rising 3 for me, none. I can easily agree that Dead Rising 3 at least has qualities of a Dead Rising game, such as psychopathic boss fights, a very tepid schedule time limit thing, Frank West not being bastardized, and uh, oh, you can still throw things in this game. Yes, I agree on all those fronts, but ignoring the Dead Rising label, Dead Rising 4, moment to moment, is simply boring, while Dead Rising 3, moment to moment, is at best mediocre, and at worst, pure fucking torture. Now, all those negatives being said, I feel it would be wrong to hide the fact that there was one combo weapon that I absolutely adored, the glove gun. It seems I missed this when playing it for the critique two years ago, likely because I wasn't interested in checklist collectible hunting. This time I powered through though, so in the middle of me finding basically everything in the game, I stumbled upon this blueprint. When hearing the noise it made, I nearly passed out from laughter, and that isn't hyperbole either. What is this? <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god, I'm gonna pass out! <laughs> the Dork Axe Joker origin story goes on for quite some time, roughly three minutes or so, but I'll cut it off here. Seriously, this weapon is the best thing in the game, far better than the worthless chop and talk or any variation of the mecha dragon or freedom bear. <laughs> the simple humor of that boing sound effect is incredible, but its effect on zombies adds to its charm. It takes them out in two hits, and on the killing blow, it pushes them back in a comedic, exaggerated fashion, leaving a trail of blood somehow. Out of anything in this game, this is the one thing I could easily see being in the original Dead Rising, likely found in one of the toy stores. It hits the mark of being relatively silly, but also innocuous enough to not feel out of place. It just looks like a toy, not something you'd ever think to use when defending yourself in a life or death situation, which makes it the perfect plaything in a Dead Rising game. Oh man, to think we could have had more enjoyable goofy weapons like this, instead of a sea of assault rifles, shotguns, and rocket and grenade launchers. Anyway, with the miniature review of Dead Rising 3 out of the way, I think it's finally time to get into the DLC. All four of these Untold Stories from Los Perdidos episodes are very similar to the core game of Dead Rising 3 in a lot of ways. I'll talk about that broad issue a little more directly after going through all four episodes though. I bring it up here to preface that there really isn't all that much to talk about with this DLC. Some new weapons, new collectibles, objectives, character interactions, and cutscenes. That's about it, so this might go pretty quick. First up is Commander Kane, not to be confused with Demon Kane or Concessions Kane. This is the quote-unquote boss I made fun of in the main game of Dead Rising 3. I usually don't love the idea of fleshing out characters after the fact like this, but I don't know, this isn't so bad. 
In all four of these stories, we gain some insight into what happened before or after we took control of Nick, which is kind of fun. Commander Kane talks to his squad in a big military aircraft about their current mission, then the biker idiots shoot a rocket at it, and voila, that's why the helicopter wreck was in the middle of the city. See, not awful. Speaking of a fallen flight vehicle though, uh, sorry, one last thing about my critique video, the random plane crash in the beginning? I still think it's silly, but it is tied to the attract video, so it's not as random as I thought. Anyway, the main side quest for Kane in this DLC is finding the squad mates who had to abandon ship. The explanation on why they're all over the city is that they jumped out at different times, one of them being jettisoned over the highway it looks like. I can appreciate the logic of why they're scattered, but since most of them jump out with their parachutes at the same time, it makes it a bit harder to believe that they've ended up in dramatically different areas. Most of them you'll find are either dead or zombified, so you'll grab their dog tag. These guys being soldiers with GPS trackers on them is a decent reason for the objective markers to know exactly where they are. A couple are alive, too, and can even tag along. Since the character level from the main game is what gets brought into this DLC, thus the attributes and specific perks carrying over, there being a way to have a quasi-posse in this batch of content works fairly well. That said, carrying over the crafting mechanic, both for weapons and cars, two characters that aren't Nick, the mechanic superhero, doesn't make as much sense. Since these DLCs have more combo weapons to play with, it certainly feels like that didn't matter much to Capcom Vancouver. I'll say, on the whole, who cares, right? This is one of the main mechanics, no pun intended, of Dead Rising 3, so keeping combo weapons in for these bits of content is whatever. That said though, this makes Nick's backstory and character all the more annoying. He's good at fixing things, right, Rhonda? You're good at fixing things! There's a lot of stuff around here! It feels like they went to a lot of effort to point out that, hey player, this combo system makes sense, these combo vehicles work too, since Nick is a mechanic. Well, actually, everyone can do it. The military commander Keen Kane guy, one of the illegals no one cares about, Angel, a high-pitched annoying biker dude, Hunter, and the ZDC doofus extraordinaire, Brad. It just feels like a big waste for Nick to be a mechanic for the sole purpose of explaining away his crafting skills, since quite clearly he should have been a championship-level boxer instead. On that note, if you didn't do all the collectible stuff on your playthrough as Nick, they show up for these characters, too. The tragic endings are stupid for the reasons I said before, but I did hear a decent argument about them being fine on paper for the character that is Nick. At best, you could say it was meant to convey that Nick isn't as grizzled as Frank and Chuck, to show that his character is more of an average Joe type of guy, reacting in a way that paints him as a bit younger and less battle-hardened. That does kind of fit with his reaction to killing Hunter Biker Boss, after all. I still don't like the implementation all the same, and the horrible puns they use don't gel well with the idea that Nick is taking this seriously, but even with the charitable view of it existing to prop up Nick's character, when taking these DLCs into account, that argument loses all of its persuasiveness. Nick reacting sad could make sense, but Commander Kane? Hunter idiot? Insanity. I get that you want this sandbox to still be explorable, to let players make progress with secrets they've missed even when playing as these characters, but oh man, does it clash seeing them react the same way to these tragic endings. The ZDC speakers don't stick out quite as bad, since every character of the four you could see wanting to get rid of them, Brad of course only after he realizes the ZDC isn't what he thought they were. The Frank trophies never made sense, so that's basically the same. Like I said, the collectibles as a whole I'll talk about later, but for Kane specifically, the hacking into terminal pole things was fine, and it was interesting that electricity attacks hacked into them as well. His best collectible by far is cleansing the illegal hideouts. Earlier you acquired a larva container in the main quest, and afterwards the safe houses appear on your map like they did with Nick. All of them are green, meaning they're safe for survivors, and it's your job, if you are up to the task, of turning everyone in there into a zombie. It's pretty horrifying to see the way Kane, and by extension, the rest of the military guys who are under Hemlock's orders, just gleefully go along with their duty of murdering these illegals. They definitely see them as the cause of this whole thing, their refusal to get shipped is what led to this outbreak. Supposedly, of course. You are definitely an evil guy doing evil things, which I normally don't love, but I actually really liked this. This way of explaining why Nick has to clear out all the safe houses of zombies doesn't feel contrived to me. It's almost clever how they reused the safe houses and the objective of doing a thing once you're there, twice essentially. You already cleared them out as Nick in the future, and now you'll make them dangerous as Kane in the past. Call me a sucker, but fuck yeah, I loved this cause and effect here. 
It reminds me of the better time travel pieces of media out there, the ones that don't have characters go changing things in the past to see a new world in the future, but taking part in causing the events that have already happened, you're just seeing it firsthand. The Prisoner of Azkaban was my favorite example of this when I was younger, but after seeing it again recently, eh, maybe Dark Souls and the Artorias of the Abyss expansion is the tried and true king. That and Futurama, of course. Oh my god! Anyway, this collectible of canes was my favorite of the entirety of the DLC stories. When it comes to the main quest, nothing much of interest happens, to be honest. Kane is part of a squad that's following orders from Hemlock, going against the president, since she got soft on the illegals and created the big mess, I guess. There's a mission where you have to keep a vehicle in one piece as you drive to a specific location, which is awful, as is the usual in all of these DLC stories, which I'll get to. The most baffling part for me was capturing the president herself. She's holed up in the mansion where you fought the sloth boss? Boss is a very charitable term for what that encounter was, I know, but still, why did this area get reused? Not a fan, imagining the lazy fart boy just chilling in his basement while all of this is going down. It is the mayor's mansion, so the connection of politicians staying at politician-like area is there, but I don't know, it feels pretty weak to me. This section is a good example to show off just how bad the enemies are in this game. This was true in the main story too, which exacerbated the heavy machine guns and rocket launcher epidemic for sure, but oh man, the shooty military guys are so awful. Shooting them isn't fun since they dodge so fast, and of course, melee strong attacks make them too easy. Even funnier though is how they have nothing to say when a lawnmower slowly approaches them. Guys, move out of the way, I'm inching towards you! They're like Michael McDonald and Austin Powers. After you capture the president, we have the ending cutscene of Kane's DLC. For the sake of the timeline and chronology of all these stories, I'm assuming after you capture her, there's a big time skip to right in the middle of the main game. Initially, I wrote a diatribe about how none of this makes any sense because they all take place in the same night and so on, but really, the only thing that can't happen in the night before Nick's story begins is this last cutscene, so I'm being nice and giving the game the benefit of the doubt. All of this Kane stuff happens before Nick's story starts, except this cutscene, which takes place in the middle. Okay, moving on. Nick scooches by as Kane gets orders to destroy the black box, which contains the incriminating evidence of everything that went on here. This scene takes place in a very specific time window, right after we saw the president become a zombie, and right before the fight with Nick. Kane decides to shoot the president instead of letting her chomp away on a member of his squad. He doesn't destroy the black box, but tells his radio person that he did. This story, as said by Jamie, is dubbed Duty. Kane checks his tattoo before the DLC starts, and right at the end, when he makes the choice to leave the black box intact. I guess I'm not sure what they were going for here. If Kane had a change of heart about this whole operation, they didn't do a good job of showing it. At the start, it seems like he honors duty above all else, but I don't know what changed in the course of the DLC. Maybe it was simply seeing the results of his actions, the zombified president about to attack one of his men? Maybe duty was referencing his duty to the American people, to not let these events go off record? I'm not sure if they were trying to make us feel sympathetic towards him, to make his goober boss status even more of a sad moment all around, or if they just had a story they wanted to tell and didn't really care about how we felt about him as a person. Either way, it ends rather abruptly without much fanfare. I do like the voice actor for Kane, though. I'll admit that, at least. Son of a bitch! Shit. Get her out of here. I said get her out of here! Sir, yes, sir! The decision to flesh out the commander boss to this extent, giving him his own DLC, is pretty laughable to me. It feels like an addendum, a mistake they're trying to rectify with more content, but it doesn't make up for the fact that in the main game of Dead Rising 3, this boss fight was slapped together and kind of lame. That said, Angel is even worse in that regard. Remember Angel? In the critique video, I said this about her. To find Angel shot dead in the head. Don't worry, she wasn't someone we've been introduced to, so her death means basically nothing to us. This nobody of a character was also fleshed out, except in every regard, it's a step down from Commander Kane. The tagline for her story is Redemption, which doesn't fit at all, and I'll get to that later, but I think the idea is she's a drunken mess of a person who always screws up, I guess. The interaction between her and Doug, whom she constantly refers to as Dougie to annoy him, is really bad and cringeworthy. Morning, Angel. <laughs> oh, wait. It's nighttime. Mm. Just taking a little me time, Dougie. That shit is top shelf. Angel, 
I, I know we've lost a lot of people lately. I know, man. I'm the one who found what was left of them. Listen, we need to keep it together and stay alive. And sober. <laughs> you know I'd never let the family down, right? <sighs> Just got word that a big yacht crashed in Central, right into the seawall. Might be people alive on there, or at least some medical supplies. Let me know if you find anything. On my way, Dougie. You know I hate it when you call me that. Oh, I sure do, Dougie. <laughs> I can't show it all, but oh my god, it's genuinely hard to stomach. I can't even view this as a so bad it's good type of campy scene. It's just... blah. Anyway, the reason I started this section off with her intro is to set the table that she's apparently a drunk. Outside of the main safe area for this DLC is her weapon and her healing item. The mace is meh, but what interested me was the infinite vodka bottles. If you didn't play around with it much in the main game, this is a great way to stumble onto the food combination outcome of two alcoholic beverages, Spitfire. I know I certainly didn't use it much, if at all, in my original two playthroughs, perhaps in part because I saw how Dead Rising 2 changed it for the worse, or because I apparently didn't realize the blunder wasn't necessary and you can craft combo food on the fly. The Spitfire kind of sucks, if I'm honest though, since there's a huge window of time after you breathe fire where you can't move, you just stand there. Like, it's the same issue that the movement system has. Why are the developers for this game obsessed with slowing the player down? Ignoring all that, the fact that you're practically given the tools to make Spitfire, a kind of unique and interesting combo, is pretty cool. And what's that? Her main collectible asks you to destroy it with fire? Oh my goodness, this is genuinely clever. Nice on you, Capcom Vancouver. You managed to add in a fun little... But wait, you can't aim the Spitfire up, and most of the posters are slightly higher than eye level for some reason. The range surely is awful too, since standing on this ledge didn't work either. Eventually, I found one at eye level, and... it didn't work. I tested it again on a different poster. Nope, didn't work. I tested once more, and... it did work? I tested it a final time, and it didn't work. I think that one success was a fluke, to be honest. Given how quickly they get destroyed with a single spurt from a flamethrower, their health surely has to be pretty low, so I think it's safe to assume that the fire breath doesn't affect them. How the Spitfire wasn't their main focus with this collectible is beyond me! Crafting a few flamethrowers to do the job wasn't horrible, I quite like being encouraged to utilize a specific combo weapon, but why wouldn't they take advantage of the character flaw they gave her? Why give her infinite vodka if this wouldn't be a solution? Exploding a propane tank nearby didn't work either, by the way. Also, you don't need to drink alcohol at all in this DLC. I realize this is going to sound crazy, but I would have kind of liked to see some gameplay gimmick related to her alcoholism. Maybe a meter of some kind where she needs to stay drunk or she'll go through withdrawals, so you'd need to drink alcohol of some kind every 10 minutes or something. Or maybe make it so you can only heal with alcohol, and orange juice and other normal food and drinks makes her barf. I don't know, some type of gameplay infusion would have been welcome. The ending to this DLC, the theme of redemption, and her backstory just feel so weird given that you can go the entire thing without drinking a drop, especially since Doug keeps telling her to stay sober and focused. All that aside, 40 fucking posters is absurd no matter how you slice it. Like I said, I didn't hate having to keep some flamethrowers in my inventory, but that number is clearly way too high. One of her side quest collectibles, the surveillance cameras, are also bad, but not for the same reasons. There are far fewer of them, and there's no obvious mispotential aspect, but they're essentially the same as the ZDC speakers, so it's nothing that unique. That's not why I think they're worse than the posters, though. This entire Untold Stories gimmick, you know, the framing for all four of these DLCs, is that Jamie is watching all of this play out through the cameras. Why would they have a player destroy the cameras? Am I just supposed to accept that all of the cameras you can remove from Los Perdidos weren't the ones Jamie was using? The time frame of this DLC is likely before the main story, and obviously Jamie uses them for the rest of the DLCs and Nick's side quests. Just so pointless, what a silly collectible to include. Her last collectible is medkits, which she just picks up. Not awful, it's mostly fine, but Jesus, her DLC has so many things to collect and do. She also has a Radiant quest thing, kind of like the rescuable survivors in the main game. You rescue survivors from an execution, the military apparently tied them up and was about to shoot them in the head. You step in, you take out the bad guy, untie the survivors. They form an invisible wall afterwards it seems like, so even when one is untied or dies, you can't jump through the gap, you get blocked. 
Also, they just keep glitching up and down sometimes. I have no idea why this game is so shit. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that was ad lib, but whatever. Angel's story and main quest are a lot worse than Kane's. Maybe I just wasn't paying attention, but so much more stuck out when playing as Angel. You have to get to a certain safe zone, and when you arrive, there's a bunch of dead survivors in there, apparently killed by military goobers, spec ops apparently. I spent a frankly stupid amount of time trying to figure out the timeline of all this, and my conclusion is that Capcom Vancouver don't even know how this all could have happened. With how Red and Annie talk about Angel, it seems like her death should happen within Nick's story, and when you visit the hotel second floor as Hunter, her corpse isn't there yet, which backs that up. Nick can't access that area at the start, since it's locked, because Capcom Vancouver likes to lock certain doors until a story thing happens. Hunter's story is the easiest to pin down, it takes place in the morning, and the ending is right before Nick's encounter with him, so that's firmly in the morning of the day Nick's story begins. However, Doug tells Angel that a yacht just crashed, and that yacht is there in Kane's story, and it's visible as Nick right away as well. Even stranger is that Angel can go into the taxi company spec ops makeshift prison thing via the gap in the fence. Do you remember the gap in the fence? The one that wasn't there as Nick early on, but became accessible later in the story? Yeah, that's there for Angel. You get locked in this area as Angel if you take that entrance, and clearly there are no spec ops here? So how could this happen after Kane's story? What really pushes this over the edge for me, and is what started me on this rabbit hole of trying to figure out how this could possibly match up, is this safe zone right here. In terms of the player's actions, yeah, it'd be kind of cool if Angel, the current player character, was reacting to the actions of Kane, the previous player character. But no, that can't possibly be correct, since there are no zombies in here, Angel says they've all been shot by government bullets, and when he says a spec ops ray took place instead. Execution style, dead center. Taxpayers pay for these bullets. Military scum. Every single one shot. Whoa, 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 Angel, look around. Maybe somebody's hiding out. Who did this? It was the spec ops. They, they grabbed some people and took them. Do you see what I'm talking about? If Kane's story happens first, this doesn't make sense at all. He turned the safe house into a zombie den for Nick to deal with in his story. That simple cause and effect makes sense, but this Angel stuff muddies the waters considerably. Does this mean Angel's story takes place first? We'd have to ignore the hunter not seeing Angel's corpse evidence for now, but let's humor this idea for a moment. So, Spec Ops raid, Angel sees the aftermath, more survivors move in, Kane arrives, turns them into zombies, Nick clears the zombies? If Angel's story does happen first, that would make Red and Annie's dialogue even stranger, since Red uses the word says. Angel says there's a computer recording of the attacks on the civilians over at the police station. Not said, says, which to me implies that there was a back and forth communication that took place very recently. He also says she, Angel, thinks they found out her position, and Annie apparently already knows it's the second floor of the hotel? That clashes with the ending to the DLC, but ignore that. That dialogue, plus her corpse looking fresh, almost being presented as if her execution just took place, would be very strange if her story happened before Kane's. Plus the yacht already being there, but whatever. However, Angel's story can't happen first, because Kane was the commander of the Spec Ops, there presumably wasn't a Spec Ops presence before his arrival, right? The other government goobers are said to be President's forces, see? And when he specifically said Spec Ops raid, that's who caused the safe house clearing? The lack of time skips throughout any of the gameplay bits as each character, and the fact that time is at a standstill, it's always nighttime, means we can't say certain events from one character happen sooner or later than events from a different character. Like, Kane even cleansed the very safe house Angel and Doug started out at, the high school. Again, these events can't coincide with each other, since Hunter doesn't see Angel's corpse at the hotel, Kane's story absolutely happens before Nick starts, it all takes place in one night, and the yacht, which Doug says just crash-landed, is there for all of them. If Kane didn't have the cleansing of the safe zones, this might not have been so confusing. If we believe the fandom page trivia, it gets even more convoluted. It says Angel's alcoholism was caused by Kane's actions? What? If both of these stories happen before Nick's, that only leaves 72 hours to work with. 72 hours from first infection to Nick's story. It's essentially saying that Kane came in hour fucking zero, wrecked the place up in 12 to 24 hours, Angel slid into depression and alcoholism because of it, and her having those traits for 12 hours or so was enough for Doug to view her as a near-lost cause, addicted to booze to the point where he assumes she's never sober. 
What the fuck, man? The safe house bit is literally driving me insane. It doesn't make any sense no matter how long I think about it, no matter how many different pieces of evidence in the game world, or how many bits of dialogue I take into consideration. One last thing about this safe house bit is that the song playing in the background is god awful. The tone is far too serious and melodramatic. How anyone can be in this moment, hear this music, and not wince is impressive. You have a stronger stomach than I. I realize this song plays in the main game in this area as well, but here it feels like it actually serves a purpose to become the backing track to the horrors Angel is seeing, and it's just cringeworthy. After Angel talks to Winnie, we hear that the Spec Ops are coming to the school next, which is our main hideout. Doug tells Angel to make it over there ASAP to help fend them off, and will continue to badger you about coming over to help. The reason I explained all of that boring stuff is for a single moment that was so ridiculous I couldn't believe it. For some reason, they tied Doug's lines about telling Angel to burn the posters when she finds them to a specific one or something, except that can't be right since the poster that triggered his line about burning the posters was already burned. While you're running around out there, maybe you can burn the shit out of some of those propaganda posters for chipping. Shit makes me sick! Even though Doug wouldn't shut the fuck up about us getting to the school to help in a life-or-death situation, he randomly mentions we should burn down posters when we come across them, even though the one right in front of me was already burned. I realize this is a giant nitpick, of course, but the game is just chock full of this stuff. It's hard to ignore all of them. Fight off a bunch of guys with guns, oh boy, that's the best part of Dead Rising, right? Gunfights? Defend NPC while he lockpicks a door. A timeless classic absolutely should be in a Dead Rising game, of course. This one is even sillier since many of the zombies simply chill out with their hands in the air, staring at you from behind the railing. This setting and this mission don't harmonize at all. The obligatory keep this vehicle intact mission, which is a Dead Rising 3 favorite at this point, is of course not fun. In a horrific twist of fate, protecting Doug from shooty-shooty enemies at the trap location is somehow the opposite of that one long trash fire of a scenario in Dead Rising 4 that I made fun of, where Brad could never die. I don't know if my game was bugged or not, but the Spec Ops people wouldn't come out at all, it was just me shooting zombies in the spot that Doug told me to be in. Once I went down to see what was going on, the Spec Ops guys came in and killed him almost immediately. This was devastating, as it reset my progress on the posters after I had just gotten all of them. He says he'll light a flare and they'll all come pouring out? Like, I don't even see a flare anywhere, what is he talking about? They spawn the moment you drop down, and you can obliterate them with one shot of the shock blaster gun thing. What's that? No more? Turn around, walk back, kill them all again. What's that? No more? Turn around, walk back, and kill them all again, again. What a stupid fucking mission. God, this game sucks so much. <laughs> this game fucking sucks. Angel kicks a spec ops dude in the balls, threatens to kill <laughs> threatens to kill him so he'll talk about where they're taking the survivors. He talks and we kill him anyway. Wow, how fun. Great. The way this <laughs> The way this DLC ends is just I'm running out of synonyms for the word bad. Horrible, terrible, awful. First of all, we've been wearing a sweatshirt this entire DLC, right? I'm wearing it while I approach the Spec Ops guy, but in the cutscene, it's gone. Kind of weird, but I suppose they wanted to assure that this DLC matched up with what we see in the main game, right? She wears a tank top, so she needs to have a white tank top on. This demonstrates that Capcom Vancouver are aware of what needs to happen for continuity's sake, and they'll do some silly things in order to achieve their goal, such as disappearing her sweatshirt. That might sound pedantic, but keep it in mind, it's important. So, after we rescue some survivors in the garage, Doug says, Oh, oh, we, more Spec Ops guys, oh boy! And even though this feels awfully similar to every other Spec Ops whatever so far, this time, Angel decides to pull a wild card and sacrifice herself. Oh, they're watching us on the cameras, right? Okay. Hey, let's go to the hotel, it's safe there. She says that to fool the Spec Ops guys into going there instead of where the survivors will actually be, you see. It's a diversion, a trap, you might say. Angel is a fucking idiot, though, since she has no idea if this camera can actually pick up audio at all. Why even ask Doug if they're watching the cameras if you don't even allow him to answer? I got an idea. They're watching us on cameras. What the hell are you doing? Everyone, get to the hotel! It's safe there! Angel, what are you up to? Take care of the family, Doug. Angel, wait! 
Given that Jamie can't hear Nick, but can see him, and factoring in the many, many security camera videos on the internet that have no sound, Angel is simply dumb as fuck for assuming this would work. However, the game goes along with this wacky logic, and Angel awaits the military dudes in the hotel. Why she decided to actually go to the hotel herself is beyond me, the plan obviously worked, the Spec Ops guys went to the wrong place, why do you need to wait there and fend them off? Oh, this is so dumb. This is after she destroyed her earpiece and told Doug to take care of the family, of course. Can't have anyone telling her how stupid this one act of pretend bravery is. So the DLC ends with Angel drinking alcohol again, of course, and then going down in a blaze of glory. Jamie says, As far as I'm concerned, Angel just earned herself some wings. I can't go that low. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Way to endorse this nonsense. Imagine if every time more enemies were on their way in action movies and video games, one member of the party decided to sacrifice themselves. Nothing would get done, and the heroes would surely lose the day. All that said, there's one detail that turns this ending from simply stupid to embarrassingly bad. Even though they made her sweatshirt disappear for continuity's sake, they have her go down in a gunfight. Her corpse in the main game has a bullet wound in the side of her head. The survivors you've been saving were about to be executed. Not my words, that's the text on screen. Executed. Angel was executed in the main game, clearly, but here? Blaze of Glory, where she would have been filled with bullet holes and left a bloody mess. The entire point of this DLC was to flesh out a character we didn't care about, yet they couldn't even get this one detail right, the only detail we have about Angel as a character from the main game, and instead they prioritized this redemption angle, which didn't even get utilized to its fullest anyway, since the alcoholism gimmick was all talk. Awful. Awful DLC. I hated every second of it, and the amount of time I spent testing and thinking about that safe zone section and the overall chronology of these stories makes me hate it even more. As far as I'm concerned, Angel just earned herself some wings. How fucking dumb is that? This might surprise some people, but Hunter's DLC was my favorite of the bunch, which is shocking even to me, since so much about him as a character and the story in this DLC is pretty lame. He was in jail, his old crew set him up, he tries to get answers, Spider, the new boss of the crew, double-crosses him, and he ends up in jail again? Talk to the old boss and get some motorcycles, then take out some biker guys and get their cock rings. Oh no, Torque is dead. Spider's gonna burn for this, costume change, boss fight, then hey, here comes Nick and Rhonda, wind me up in the garage like a jack-in-the-box. <laughs> Pretty silly, but hey, at least there's a- <laughs> Pretty silly, but hey, at least there's a boss fight, too if we count Razorface, Dingus. Tork- <laughs> Tork himself is pretty funny. When you talk to him after he gives you the quest to get his motorcycles, he just keeps saying, quit messing around and grab them bikes, which is just delightful. Hang on, should I have been paying attention? Quit messing around. Grab those bikes. Grab those bikes. The mission where you grab the motorcycles is essentially the main reason I liked this DLC so much. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure this is the only quest in the entire game where you don't get a destination marker pointing you exactly where you need to go. Having to explore on my own to find the three bikes was beyond refreshing. Afterwards, the side quest where you grab more bikes is a little less cool, since it does place the blue marker right on the ones you need to find, and if they blow up on the way there and you saved afterwards, maybe due to PTSD about losing the Angel poster's progress before, they're gone forever. The latter is annoying full stop, but the former is something I can understand. I would love it if I had to find all these bikes on my own, but not in this open world. No, maybe a map the size of Dead Rising 2, or even one of these four sections. Not this bloated, sprawling mess of gray and brown. That said, I still really enjoyed these bike retrievals, even if they're optional and have a marker on them, because the gameplay on offer here appeals to me considerably. With how often I shit on the driving, blockades, and the world layout, you might be wondering how that's possible. Well, there are more gaps at your disposal for something the size of a bike to sneak through, once I even had to go into a building through the normal doorways. This is also the only time, with the vehicle or on foot, where it felt natural and kind of fun to weave in and out of zombie hordes. It reminded me of how Dead Rising used to be, finding the empty spaces to weasel your way through, avoiding damage and maintaining your speed in the process. 
Opposed to every other instance of this type of objective, keeping my vehicle intact for the bike retrievals felt like a tense and engaging challenge. The lack of a health bar and them being optional could be reasons as to why they're more enjoyable than the others I've complained about, but I don't think that's it. Genuinely, I think because the motorcycle is a more narrow vehicle, one that you can make efforts to avoid zombies and roadblocks alike with, it feels like I have more freedom when on the move. I would say, perhaps this means I should have used motorcycles more often in the main game when traveling back and forth, but I'll be honest, the thought of finding a nearby bike solely to drive to a destination marker on the other side of the map to continue with some boring story objective or something doesn't sound fun either. Maybe this, somehow, scratched that itch that Death Stranding did, that Dying Light sometimes did. Delivery fetch quests executed in a very specific way, the perfect balance of whatever it is I look for in those. Returning them all via the same pathways near the end also faintly resembles how rescuing survivors felt in Dead Rising 1 and 2. There's a comfort in seeing the familiar assets when nearing the finish line, but you know you're not completely in the clear. You still need to babysit this deliverable until you're officially home free. All that said, the mandatory bike retrieval after the optional ones are presented, the one that the game slaps a health bar on, seems incredibly forced. Torque needs it so he can make a combo vehicle, just the motorcycle with blades on it. This isn't necessary for anything. Your next task is to get Razorface's cock ring. The trek back isn't even difficult. It has one of the shortest routes, if not the shortest, just out of the garage and up the highway on-ramp, and given that you may have already returned a few optional bikes, it feels extremely easy by comparison, so much so that I thought it was only part one of the mission. This is what I mean by forced. It's as if Capcom Vancouver had a checklist they had to adhere to for every DLC, and one of the priorities on there was including a vehicle quest that has a health bar visible. Even though I complained about your invisible stamina bar being invisible, the health bar isn't something I need to see here. Then again, maybe I'm equating my distaste for the usual vehicle missions with the health bar, when really, it's the idea of these mandatory missions in the first place. It's just so odd, they already had an abundance of these types of objectives in this DLC, and frankly, all of them are better than this one anyway, and this isn't necessary for anything. Just seems like a waste, and I'd imagine this only made players who didn't enjoy the bike retrievals to be pretty fatigued with them overall. I mean, as much as I like them, there's a ton of optional bikes to find and drive back. This one added to the pile definitely wasn't helping the DLC's case. Hunter's collectibles are okay, I guess. Special whiskey bottles to grab, and emergency phones to destroy? Eh, nothing amazing or anything, mostly whatever. I don't quite understand the gang member rings you can grab after defeating bikers. The pop-up on the upper left feels wonky with it too. Killing one of them elicits the same noise and visual as when a survivor dies. They're enemies though, so it feels kind of odd. In addition to that, acquiring the ring takes a couple seconds to go away, then the 1000 PP takes a couple seconds to go away afterwards. It can be a never-ending cascade of notifications, the most recent of which feel like they're two minutes delayed. For a more specific example, here I grab what I think should be my 30th whiskey, and I have to wait for all the other crap to pop up and go off screen to confirm it. It even shows the location I arrived in before the whiskey notification. Just dumb. The two boss fights are nice to see. Very strange that the other DLCs don't have any up to this point, but I'll get to that later, I guess. The Razorface boss fight feels kind of random, though, since he's one of the three doofuses you need to take out, and the other two weren't a boss fight. Just look how quickly the dingus known as Cannon goes down. Although I do love the glove gun, it feels weird how strong it is. Not sure if its strength would be something I'd keep if it were somehow in the original Dead Rising. Spider as a character is boring, but what's weird is how much he reminds me of Day of Navarro. Did they model Spider directly off of him, or what? His boss fight begins, and they give him a cheap shot on me or something. He ends up tackling me before the fight really starts. This boss fight is a decent example of how difficult it must be to create a genuinely good boss encounter for Dead Rising. Without a core gimmick, with fun attacks and a good arena, you're left with a one-on-one -on -one fight with the regular combat mechanics, which... I mean, isn't all that interesting or enjoyable. The fight ends with a meh death animation, and like I said, they all goofily get prepared to be killed by Nick in mere moments. With Angel, we knew all of this was leading to her death, but this feels so much worse. Everything we did was for nothing. We collected how many bikes for Torque? He's dead. We killed every gang member in Los Perdidos, it seems like, but even that didn't dwindle their numbers enough to not be a huge hassle when playing as Nick. We killed Spider and took the gang back, only for the gang and the leader to die a few minutes later. Maybe this story should have stayed untold. 
It wasn't interesting, none of the characters were likable, and none of it mattered. Bear with me here, Brad, ZDC agent Dingleberry, is lame, and his DLC is mostly forgettable. Kind of wild that the one character Dead Rising 4 brought back was this dude, this completely forgettable guy. This content has to take place after the main game, or at the very least, near the end of it, since Nick shows up in the beginning cutscene to yell at us, we find the lab with the experiment already done and happened with, and at the end we see... Rhonda and Gary. Uh, I mean, I get it, this is their ride after the overtime ending, but why was Nick here just now? I don't know, moving on. Brad is such a boring character that when I saw him interact with Kane, a character I didn't particularly love or anything, it made me view Kane in a far more favorable light. Kinda neat how these two DLC characters meet up, would have been kind of interesting to see more of their paths cross like this. Oh man, beyond this one moment, I couldn't even tell you what else happens. Brad comes to realize that the ZDC isn't that great, is surprised to learn about Hemlock and Marion's orders and the events that took place, he extracts his chip from his neck and saves some people. In this DLC, Brad gets the Radiant Survivor Rescues, which are awful, awful content. They appear so frequently, and they, full stop, just make no sense sometimes. Just look at this utter goofball, Eva. In fact, I'll let my stream self talk shit about it so I can get a break. What the hell did it help for? Eva, let's just go this way. Eva, what are you doing here? Those zombies can't touch you. This is so fucking stupid. Right. The survivors also seem to disappear faster than they did in the main game. Before, they would run for a while, and here they vanish almost right away. So many goobers with guns and rocket launchers. So, so many Zombrex chips to collect, both mandatory and optional. It's insane how often that objective comes up, like, my god, please make it stop. If you couldn't tell by now, this is where the apathy really started to kick in. I hate this game, and if I wasn't streaming these DLCs, I likely wouldn't have been able to push through and finish them. This ZDC dingling is so uninteresting to me, and I was so spent that I stopped caring about the side content and didn't even do the collectibles. The whole 10 in each area nonsense is utter padding which is what Angel had in her DLC as well, with the cameras. One of his collectibles is burning bio-waste piles or something. I didn't even touch that one. Oh, now the bootleg Zombrex is a collectible too. Nah, no thanks. For some reason, the bikers are still here! Like, what the fuck, man? How many are in this gang? A thousand? You have to kill a few groups of them for the main quest. For some reason, because this DLC sucks. The side characters are weird, the doctor you report to just stands outside the fucking hospital the entire time? What on earth, lady? Go inside! They even spawned a zombie in her range for some reason, so every time you see her, it's there. I wanna stop playing. Please. Okay, now what? Now what? Why is there always a fucking zombie there? Lady, do something about him. Lady, for fuck's sake. Okay, what? Thank you so much, Brad. Retrieve more Zombrex for the survivors that are all definitely at the hospital, sure. Fuck, man. The Smart Mouth Hacker Guy is a Smart Mouth. Great. Cool. This DLC is themed Justice, and I don't know, he gets his justice alright. I gotta wrap this up, this is getting embarrassing. The last thing I'll talk about in this forgettable DLC is the final mission. It's like a boss fight, but the enemy is the shitty open world of Dead Rising 3. Keep this vehicle alive while you cosplay a taxi driver, picking up survivors and other NPCs at certain stops, and you basically have to skirt around the entire open world map, avoiding every blockade, meaning you'll need to open the map screen over and over, driving and driving. Oh god, just awful. Unbelievably, the fuckers actually added more roadblocks to the map for this bit of content to make the route even more drawn out. I just, I just, I don't want, I don't wanna, I don't wanna do this anymore. How do I get out of here? Even better, you can't jump over these ones. Have a listen to my reaction in real time. Where the fuck am I? Are you goddamn kidding me? Are you goddamn kidding me? Don't you fucking... Are you goddamn kidding me here? Are you fucking kidding me here? What? I don't give a fuck about Biohead. Oh my god. Oh my god. No. No. Oh.
Okay, let's turn around. Also, it's hilarious to me that the firework factory is basically a part of the road in this game, since it's the only workaround to the roadblocks when you're in the lower left section of the map. The bit with Rhonda and Gary was so confusing, I legitimately couldn't comprehend what was happening on screen. Have a listen. Everyone get in. Everyone get in! What are you guys doing? Gary? What? Gary and Rhonda? What's happening? <laughs> I don't know why it gave me the option to talk to them if they can't say anything, What's going on? but all I had to do was drive forward two inches. Then they all take turns sitting on top of each other. Gary just sat on Rhonda's lap. Did you see it? <laughs> After you drive to the finish line, helicopter or something, yeah. Thank fuck we're done. Oh wait, now I remember. I didn't just lose interest in the Zombrex chip side quest. One of them fell into a fence that's unbreakable. And when I saved and reloaded, it didn't reset to a better spot. No way. Are you kidding me? This game sucks and I hate it. Now that I've gone through all four DLCs kind of in depth, it's time to generally speak on the Untold Stories content as a whole. Besides Frank Rising, this is the worst DLC in the series. Yes, I'd take the golf course over this. Case Zero and Case West are inherently better due to being Dead Rising 2, but they also had brand new areas to explore and a boss fight to close each bit of content out. The fact that all of this takes place in the same map as the main game, and every new collectible is functionally similar to the ZDC speakers and Frank statues, what these stories are, essentially, is more Dead Rising 3. To the right person, that could be a positive. If you liked what Dead Rising 3 had to offer, hey, look at that, more things to collect, more stuff to do, kinda. If you detested the game, like me, this is just an extra 20 hours of the same dog shit. Even worse, since I made an effort to do the majority of the side quest this time, when I could anyway, and find and collect the semi-personalized variations of the Frank statues and ZDC speakers. At the very least, there were some unique weapons and combos in this content, much like the Dead Rising 2 DLC. I mean, you can already access this stuff via lockers in the main game, and craft them too, I think, but whatever. It seems there's a few character-specific weapons and a host of new things to make. The dual knives were okay, the mace is whatever, but the machine pistols were cool. The helmet doohickey was pretty good, I liked how easy it was to clear space in front of me. The slag shot looks cool, but I found it to be kind of pathetic. You'd think with a visual like that, it could take out a cluster of zombies, but sometimes it would take two for a single guy. Wild. The turbine blower, however, was pretty amazing, no lie. I love weapons that simply push away enemies and knock them around the environment, so this was fun. It does blow up when you drop it though, which is strange, but also hilarious. It's, what's that? Oh, it's a stick pony. <laughs> Brad gets the pacifier gun, which just blows up zombies' heads as if you killed a queen, essentially. The many new combo weapons are fine, but it was kind of odd how much Angel's DLC was begging you to use the shock blaster. It is good, but putting infinite defibrillators and assault rifles next to each other? I don't know, just kind of goofy. I guess Brad's kept throwing the turbines at you too. Their only being bosses in Hunter's DLC was also a huge letdown. Obviously, a big part of the Dead Rising charm are the psychopath boss fights, and the two Dead Rising 2 DLCs had one each, Case West's being pretty good, I think. To not have any for three of the DLCs made them feel more empty than they would have otherwise. Then again, if the best they could come up with is Razorface and Spider... I don't know, man, maybe Capcom Vancouver just sucks at this. I know what you're thinking, Capcom Vancouver made Dead Rising 2, and that's good. Yes, you're right, but something that was funny was looking into Shadow of Rome and seeing that Kaije Inafune, the executive producer and main voice of Shadow of Rome and Dead Rising, was involved with Dead Rising 2, but wasn't in Dead Rising 3. More broadly, Dead Rising 1's team was basically all Japanese, 2 was a mix of Japanese and North American, and then in 3, there's not a Japanese name in sight. Obviously, I'm not saying Japanese developers are inherently better than North American ones, 
but the people who understood this series and knew what they were doing evidently slowly fizzled away with each successive game, until Dead Rising 3 was left with an all-new batch of people who didn't understand the charm of the series in the first place. Argue with me all you want, I'd rather play Dead Rising 4. Both are garbage games, but at least in that one, I don't have to worry about constant roadblocks or Frank's terrible movement system. That's it, I'm done. I can't take any more of this game. I hate it so much, I hate it so much. I've now streamed the full game, streamed all the DLCs, and did a video on the DLCs. My karmic debt is repaid. I'm off the hook forever. You can't ask me to go back to this trash. You can't. I'm not getting fooled again. Maybe Dead Rising Mobile, but not this. Never this. No. If I haven't played enough of my stream reactions for you as of yet, I'll close out the video with a few more. In the base game, and in some way- why am I taking this fucking goober over there? Oh my god, please, please, no football zombies, please. No! <laughs> I hate this game. <laughs> Oh no, I hate this game so much. <laughs> oh no. No. <laughs> no. Let's go, Nelson. You stupid fuck. Try not to lose your head in a crisis. You could have put that fucking... There's a hundred. There's a thousand. There's... Probably not a million of these of dead bodies that have their heads chopped off. Why is that one so fucking special? Hmm? Can someone tell me that? Why is that one so fucking special? Zombie outbreaks typically produce a great deal of garbage. What are you, what are you even talking about? What are you fucking talking about, game? What are you talking about, Dead Rising? Who are the writers for this game? What are they talking about? What do you what do you mean? What do you mean? What are you what are you talking about? What is this one gonna say? He really lost his head over her. That's two beheading ones! We, we just, we, you can't, you can't do that, man. You can't use the same one twice. You can't use the same pun twice. Just do it, just do it, interact with it. Last call. <laughs> get it, last call. You guys get it, last, last call. Fucking dumb. This game's awful. Hi, my name is Dead Rising, and, and I want to be awful today. Oh, hi, Dead Rising. You came right on time. Are you the third Dead Rising or the fourth Dead Rising? Oh, does it matter? We're both terrible. <laughs> oh, I guess you're right there. <laughs> People think the fourth game is so much worse, when really, they're both equally shit. They're both garbage in their own ways. <laughs> Don't tell my mom I said that.